It's good to be with you again. I'm excited we have this opportunity to read our Bibles and understand the story. You know, I don't read my Bible just to gather facts or accumulate information or so I can appear smart with when biblical topics come up. I read my Bible so I can be changed, to be transformed, to understand the character of God, how to allow the power of God to be present in my life, to know God's purposes for me, so how I can lead a life that will bring fulfillment and contentment and joy to me. All of that comes from the Word of God. If you're not in the habit of reading your Bible, you're forfeiting something. It's not a burden. You can know the story of the Bible. If I can read my Bible and understand it, so can you. Well, our topic this week is the wisdom literature, the writings in the Hebrew Bible. The book of Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the Song of Solomon, right at the center of the Bible and the center of the God story for you and me. Enjoy the lesson. The next book, if we're just walking through them chronologically, is the book of Psalms. Arguably the most familiar book in the whole Bible. It's the most quoted. Uh, many of the Psalms or lines from the Psalms have made their way into contemporary language and literature. It's the longest book in our Bible. It's 150 chapters. Uh, it is a collection of um, poetry and songs. The majority of it was collected or written by King David. But some of the Psalms are as old as Moses. So the book of Psalms really stretches out over a lengthy period of time. It was most likely compiled and put together in a written format during the period of the exile. As long as the temple existed in Jerusalem and the priests were there and serving their functions, it wasn't overly necessary for the people to have that. Worship was a part of being at the temple. But when the temples destroyed and they were driven out of the land, they needed to capture all of these things in a way that they didn't lose their national history. Uh, the book of Psalms are very helpful for, uh, to enable you and me to understand how to worship God. Um, th there's a lot of ways that the, the book of Psalms can be pulled apart and analyzed. We're not going to do that tonight in any great detail. Uh, I'll give you a big picture. It is collected in your Bible in five separate books. Uh, I gave you the chapter breakouts there. I don't think there's anything any more sophisticated in that explanation than when it was written down. It was too large for any single scroll, so it was collected on multiple scrolls. Because the length of those, cha those, the length of those passages is about the same. I don't think it's any more complex than that. Um, there are some groupings of the psalm that have specific meaning. Maybe one of the most celebrated or most discussed are the psalms of ascent. Uh, it's Psalm 120 through 134. It's 15 psalms that those traveling to Jerusalem would read on their way up to Jerusalem. No matter how you approach Jerusalem, you have to go up to get there. Whether you come from the east or the west or the south, Jerusalem is nestled in a group of hills and you have to climb to get there. And the Psalms of Ascent were used by the pilgrims making the trip to Jerusalem. Three times a year, God commanded the people to go to Jerusalem for religious celebrations. Sometimes those of us in Christianity are critical about our annual celebrations. We, we invest quite a bit of energy in them around here, but through the years, I, we've, I've heard those discussions. You know, Christmas wasn't about, you know, Jesus wasn't born on December 5th. No fooling. Or I don't know why you make such a big deal about Easter. But we're, we're really holding a tradition that God implemented in his people long, long ago, way back here over in the book of Exodus. Now, I agree he started with Passover and some other things, but the notion of remembering on an annual basis the significant things God has done on behalf of his people are an important part of maintaining cohesiveness of our story and focusing us on an annual basis on what God has done. I could not agree more with the statement that Easter is not about a new dress, but I do think there's something significant to saying there are seasons in the year when worshiping God deserves an expenditure of effort. And so we try to model that. If you haven't been around here for Easter, we kind of lean into that. <laughs> Thank God he's given us that privilege. But the book of Psalms, those Psalms of Ascent were read by the pilgrims as they climbed to Jerusalem. They were also used by the priest as they climbed the 15 steps into the temple. You can read them when you get there. there. There are songs that lift your heart and your perspective from the earth up to the Lord. Some of the Psalms have some very specific applications. Many of the Psalms have little headings above them that tell, will tell you if David authored them or maybe a, a snippet of the history that goes with them. Psalm 51 is a classic example of that. Psalm 51 is a psalm of David 
that he put together after he was confronted by the prophet Nathan for his sin with Bathsheba and murdering her husband. You know, the Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. One of the wonderful parts of the scripture and one of the things that will bring integrity to it as you read it is God doesn't shield us from the reality of his people. David is a remarkable man. I mean, his life speaks to us across all these centuries, challenging us to be men and women that learn to worship God and yield to him. And yet he was a man that was, was subject to all of the frailties that f fill our lives. But Psalm 51 is David's prayer of repentance after he realizes his sin has been exposed. Look at it with me. It's in your notes. He said, have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love and according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. I'm not sure Uriah would have held with that opinion. But David understood a far more significant principle. Our sins, our ungodly acts may touch the lives of human beings, but the ultimate offense is against an almighty God. You will find remorse more quickly if you understand that your rebellion isn't against a person, your rebellion against, is against a living God. David helps us with that. Look in verse 6, Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. And I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will turn back to you. It's a marvelous psalm to have tucked in your own personal portfolio. When, you, there's a, when there's a season when you need to repent, and you say, God, I don't know how to do that. I'm, I'm learning to pray, but I don't know how to do this very well yet. God, I know I, I'm sorry, and I know I need to change, but I don't know what to say. Take Psalm 51 and begin to pray it out loud. Make it your prayer. If you're helping somebody else, and they come and say, you know, I've been a long way from God. I've lived an ungodly life or I've done some ungodly things and I need to change. Take Psalm 51. See, the, one of the things that I believe we're going to be able to take down out of this exercise together this year is the Bible is going to become a tool in your hands in a whole new way. Not a mysterious collections of undecipherable stuff and names that you can't pronounce. But the beginning of a toolbox that, will bring the, that the Holy Spirit will use to bring transformation in your life and that you in turn can use to help other people experience that transformation. That is really, really good news. Makes me smile every time I think about it. Psalm 23 is one of the best known of the Psalms. Again, collected by King David. He began, we're introduced to him in scripture as a shepherd boy. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. One of the fun things to me about the multiple translations that are available to us is I'll take seasons and go back and read the book of Psalms in a different translation. Because the, the, just the, the shift of a word or a turn of a phrase, particularly in poetry. You know, we are reading a translation. This was not written in English. The book of Psalms would have been written originally in Hebrew, and the Hebrew language is a very simple, very straightforward, it's an ancient language, so it isn't uh, highly inflected or complex. And sometimes I think the, the, the majesty is lost a bit in the translations, and in, in reading another translation, sometimes you'll, you'll capture a whole new perspective. Sometime back, I was walking through a difficult season, and there were some needs, and I was, I'd been crying out to the Lord, and it was keeping me awake. And I was laying in bed one night, and I kept... I kept thinking of the 23rd Psalm. And, and I was quoting it in my head. The Lord's my shepherd, I shall not be in want. I was, I was aggravated. I thought, why do you keep waking me up with the 23rd? I know the 23rd Psalm. I don't need to read it. 
So I finally got up and picked up a Bible that was laying in my room, and when I opened it, it was a different translation, and it said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall lack nothing. Well, it may mean the same as not being in want, but somehow when I realized I didn't lack anything, I relaxed. God's my shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know the old joke that the pastor's wife said, I'm glad that God's goodness and love follow you, but if I catch Shirley, you're in trouble. The book of Psalms is a wonderful thing to read at a slower pace and reflect upon. I know now we're hammering through the story and we got to get all the way through the maps. And so you're not likely to stop and reflect. But over the summer or when you have some more time, invest more than 10 minutes a day. There's 150 Psalms. If you read uh, five chapters a day, you can read the whole book in a month. Or but, but just put a psalm a day into your diet. It's a wonderful way to put a tool in your heart. The Spirit of God will make a worshiper out of you. Worship isn't when the band hits their first note. Worship is an attitude that starts within us. We'd like to invite you to join us for one of our weekend worship services here at World Outreach Church. You'll find lots of friendly people, engaging worship, and transformational encounters in exploring the Word of God together. There's something here for the whole family. You can choose from four service times, Saturdays at 5 and 7 p.m., Sundays at 8.30 and 10.30 a.m. Located right off of I-24, we're easy to find. You can visit our website to find our location. So join us. We'd love to see you here at World Outreach. The book of Psalms is followed up with the book of Proverbs. We did an entire series, New Year's series, about the book of Proverbs a few years ago. Um, Proverbs is a collection of wisdom typically attributed to King Solomon. He that wrote them or collected them, the wisest king Israel ever knew. Uh, Proverbs chapter 2, I think, kind of gives you the punchline. It says, my son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turn your ear to wisdom, apply your heart to understanding. Proverbs is a book about wisdom, but in this, these few verses, you're going to get the key on how you acquire it. Look at the words that I have emboldened. It says, accept my words, store up my commands, turn your ear, apply your heart, call out for insight, cry aloud. If you look for it as for silver and you search for it as hidden treasure, then you'll understand the fear of the Lord and you'll find the knowledge of God. Is that a casual process? Is that ripping a promise out of the promise box while you swallow your instant breakfast on the way out the door? No. You see, at some point, we're going to have to reorient what we imagine seeking the Lord is. What Proverbs gives you such a beautiful picture of is a presentation of consequences and outcomes. Proverbs tells you at the beginning of the journey what the outcomes are, the consequences are for many of life's decisions. It takes all the mystery out. It makes life an open book test. It's a collection of short, parallel sayings often that tell you if you make this choice, this is what will happen. Well, it's not instantaneous. We're not going to manipulate God with his word. But he says if you choose a pathway, this is what it will bring to your life. You look at Proverbs 3 and verse 7. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Hebrew poetry is often written in couplets, two ideas, kind of parallel ideas put side by side. You need both halves to get the meaning. That's true here. It says, don't be wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord, and shun evil. Basically, think God's smarter than you are. And there's an outcome for that. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. There's a fun way to study Proverbs sometime. There's only 31 chapters. It's not a huge endeavor. But read through the book of Proverbs and watch what causes movement and watch what moves. God causes things to come to you or he causes things to go away from you. One of the things God will cause to come to you is resources. Money moves. 
We call it a liquid asset. It flows. And God will cause it to flow towards you or away from you. It's a biblical principle. I know people get offended by it, but it's biblical. We've already had the offering. You're safe. And in this case, it says that if you learn to fear the Lord and shun evil, it will bring, it will cause health to come to you. Does it mean godly people don't get sick? No, it doesn't say that. But over the breadth of your life, the fear of the Lord and godliness, avoiding evil, will, will cause you to be healthier. And we can support that. Look at Proverbs 22. Humility and the fear of the Lord bring something to you. Wealth, honor, and life. If you would like wealth, honor, and life, I would encourage you to cultivate humility and a reverence for God. If you're not interested in wealth or honor or a long life, don't. But if those three things matter to you, there's the process. And the book of Proverbs is filled with them. It's another thing that's easy to put into a daily reading routine. There's 31 chapters. If you just read a chapter a day, you work through the whole book of Proverbs in the course of a month. Pick a verse for every time you read it. If you read a chapter a day, just circle a verse that's your verse for the day. Write it on a card or put it on a, some electronic way to chase you through your day and you won't lose it. Proverbs is a wealth of God ideas for bringing good consequences and good outcomes for your life. The best things in life have long-term lead times. If you want good things in your life, begin to plant seeds that will cause the harvest to come that you want. We are too focused too frequently on immediate gratification. You have to decide in your life if you're trying to grow a yard full of dandelions or a grove of oak trees. And Proverbs will give you the ways to plant seeds that will cause the years ahead of you to bring the blessings of God to your life. Not because of the economy we live in or the wisdom of our lives, because God is our source. What a powerful idea. And then we read Ecclesiastes, also credited to Solomon. Um, Ecclesiastes is is an English translation, and maybe the most literal translation for the name of the book is the teacher. Uh, it's a perspective from King Solomon at the end of his life. And it says, the words of the teacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What does man gain from all his labor which he toils under the sun? That phrase, under the sun, is used 28 times in the book of Ecclesiastes and nowhere else in the Bible. Ecclesiastes is really a struggle with this question about our lives and what we do with them. Solomon is the wisest king to ever come to the throne of Israel, the wealthiest king to ever sit on the throne of Israel. He expanded the boundaries of the nation to their, to their greatest extent in the history of that nation. And yet when he looks at the end of his life, he was a man that pursued pleasure with great enthusiasm. 300 wives and 700 concubines, 300 wives of royal birth. All of his wives were princesses. Just reflect on that a minute. Solomon was allowed to build the temple in Jerusalem. He made Israel an international place. And yet his take on his life, when he reflects on it, is he said, it's all meaningless. And he's very candid with it. I put the passage, we won't read it, but he said, when I looked at pleasure, he said, I tried it all. I tried physical pleasure. I tried happiness. He said, I tried success. Any project I could imagine, I've accomplished. And the truth is, he did. And he said, but when I look at it all from this end of my life, he said, it seems meaningless. It's futile. Somebody's going to inherit what I've done and they won't care about me. Is that prophetic? Within 10 years of his death, the nation was torn apart. He said, it's meaningless. It's a, it's a staggering, sobering reminder not to lead our lives only with the concept of time. You see, under the sun defines our life on this earth. And if there's anything our timeline is helping us begin to imagine, it's that being the people of God is this invitation into an eternal perspective. How else could Abraham have seen Jesus and rejoiced in that day? 
You see, we get so pulled into the now and to my comfort and my momentary wants when we read things like the book of Revelation and the return of Jesus, rather than celebrate, we freak out. Well, we're not there now, are we? That's really hard. It looks like the malls will be closed. <laughs> They're not going to cancel the NFL season, are they? But if we recognize that our lives aren't just about what we get under the sun, that we are citizens of the eternal kingdom of an almighty God and that he is our source and that he has a plan for us and a purpose for us to bring good things to us, honor and long life and health, we'll follow him. And the book of Ecclesiastes invites us towards that. The last verses of the book I put in your notes, Ecclesiastes 12. This is the conclusion. It says, now all has been heard. Here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it's good or evil. And the last book in this collection is the Song of Songs. Again, Solomon is credited with this. It's a love poem. Solomon is, is tradition says he wrote a thousand poems. 300 wives, 700 concubines, a poem for each of his wives, and this is the poem for the one that he truly loved. I just relay, relay the information, I didn't create it. Irrespective of that, this book is about a relationship. It's a very candid book, it's a very forthright book. It's one you don't hear discussed a lot. But it invites us into the emotion of a relationship with God, and I think that is intriguing. It invites us into this notion that, is, that, that God wants a relationship with his people. Not in the physical context that it's described, but that's certainly the way that we understand most directly to relate to it. But if you think about what you know with the scripture, God doesn't just bark commands and issue orders. Think of Jesus and Peter in Galilee after Jesus denies the Lord, when Jesus needed a friend the most and, and Peter swears he doesn't know him, when Jesus sees him next in Galilee, what does he say to him? Does he castigate him? Does he reprimand him? Does he read him the riot act? Does he say, I'm sorry I recruited you? You lily-livered, useless follower. What were you thinking? What does Jesus say to Peter? Peter, do you love me? Do you, you think the emotion of all that Peter had failed to do came crashing down on Peter with that little phrase? I do. Did Jesus need to say a bit more? Peter, do you love me? See, I don't think God comes to us and says, you know, did you do your reading today? Did you go to three services this weekend? I think God would say to you or to me, do you love me? Do you love me? And then the book of, the Song of Songs kind of invites us towards that. And it also reminds us in, in, in very candid ways that our relationship with the Lord is very personal. I mean, there's a sexual quality to, to the Song of Songs, but it also reminds us that it's very public. And, and I, as I reflected on this in preparation, it, it was startling to me. I find that we are typically prepared for the Lord to be our shepherd and to lead us beside still waters. We have a pretty, pretty significant comfort level with a personal relationship with the Lord. I, I can get pretty universal acceptance of that notion. We are much less comfortable when we think about the public side of our relationship with the Lord. He's also the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We're going to reign with him. And that means to be a Christ follower is not just a public decision. It's about being public. It's not just a private decision. It's about being public. That relationship is exposed. It's examined. Others look at it and consider it. They look at the relationship. And all of that is, is, is enmeshed in this Song of Songs. Three books credited to Solomon. A Song of Songs, typically imagine that he was written, written when he was a younger man and in love. The book of Proverbs is crafted as if it were being given to his children to guide them with the wisdom that he's been given through their lives. The book of Ecclesiastes, from the perspective of the end of his life, for all of his achievement and all of his wealth, he's reminding them that their days under the sun have to have a greater significance than just that season. Pro the book of Psalms, 
will, will lift your heart to the Lord. It will walk you through the challenges of day-to-day -day living. It will help you process the tragedies that the book of Job tells us are a part of the journey. It's a very important part of your Bible, and I pray it becomes a familiar part to you and a comfortable part to you. It's a part where you don't have to worry so much about who the king is or whether they're in Egypt or they're in the promised land or whether the Jericho is falling. It points our heart towards God and helps us wrestle with what it means to be people alive under the sun, but to not lose sight of eternity and to know God's love. God's word is such a precious gift in our lives. If you're not in the habit of reading it on a regular basis, a daily basis, I want to strongly encourage you to make that effort. Just a few minutes every day in the Word of God will change your life. Let me give you a simple way to begin. Take the book of Proverbs. There's 31 chapters. Simply read the chapter that corresponds with the day's date. It'll give you a little devotional for every day, a little God burst into the midst of your day, a God idea. It'll be a help to you. And if you miss a day or two, just choose the chapter that corresponds with the date and re-engage again. It'll help you. I want to pray for you before we go. Father, give us a hunger for your word like we've never had before. Open it before us. May it come alive in our hearts that we may hear your direction and your guidance for us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Join us every week for another exciting message from Pastor Alan Jackson. And until then, visit us online at intendministries.org and discover remarkable information and resources to help take your Christian life to the next level. And when you visit online, consider joining our effort to continue sending this powerful and challenging message around the globe. We want to share this program worldwide, but we can only do it with your help. So consider partnering with us today. And if you're visiting the Nashville area, we'd love to see you at World Outreach Church in Murfreesboro. We're easy to find, so look us up when you're traveling through. And don't forget to connect with Pastor Jackson every day through social media. Thanks so much for joining us and being a part of this ministry. We'll see you again next time for another encounter with Pastor Alan Jackson. <laughs>